Okay, I think we'll get started. I want to welcome you to our third Lunch and Learn of uh, this particular semester, and we will be having um, uh, the last Lunch and Learn for 2017 um, and in December, and I would encourage you to visit the Hawkeye Lunch and Learn website so that you can register for that event. It's my extreme pleasure today to welcome Dr. David Johnson, he's Dean and Professor of Pediatric Dentistry of the College of Dentistry here at the University of Iowa. And he received his DDS degree from the University of Michigan in 1970 and his MS in Pediatric Dentistry here at the University of Iowa in 1973. He's board certified in Pediatric Dentistry and um, he was on the faculty at West Virginia University from 1974 until 1980. He received the Outstanding Teacher Award in 1976, and he was on the faculty at Case Western Reserve University from 1980 to 1995. And he served there as a department chair and also as interim dean um, for a period of time. He has been Dean of our College of Dentistry since 1995, and please join me in welcoming today Dr. David Johnson. Great, welcome. You can turn this down now. Dim this slide now. Can I dim this slide now? Thank you, yeah. Welcome. Um, I want to make this an interactive uh, session, and the topic today is to talk about oral health as part of total health. So um, I'm gonna, gonna start off with a question here, and I think I know the answer, because I think I know almost everybody in the audience here. Uh, how many people here have been to the dentist in the last year? Okay, okay, right there, we are dealing with a very select audience, because there's a big group of people in this country and around the world that have not been to a dentist, either maybe they were a little bit nervous about going to the dentist, uh, sometimes people are low income, some people live in extreme rural areas, they can't access it. Sometimes people live in a nursing home and they just can't get the care. Uh, so we're dealing with a fairly uh, select group here. Okay, next question. Uh, at what age did you start going to the dentist? Let me give you some choices here, okay? Five or less is one. How many people started, okay, okay, maybe between five and ten, okay? Okay, again, we're dealing with a select group here because uh, as a pediatric dentist, we would like to have people really start at least getting somebody to look at your teeth by the time you're around one because the teeth are coming in and if certain habits coming in, come in like kids sleeping with a bottle, it can really, with a nursing bottle, I mean, uh, the, the teeth can deteriorate really very quickly. So we like to get them started, even if you don't need to see them more than say once a year for a, you know, for a quick check. So I think that says an awful lot. Okay, tough one here. On a scale of one to five, how much do you like your dentist? Okay, one, not very much. Five, I love my dentist. Five, five. Okay, we're dealing with a, got a four here, fives, mostly fives. People generally like their dentist. Again, a very select group. So what we try to do is get people going to the dentist early so that when they do have a problem, it's someone that they have established a relationship with, someone that they feel comfortable with. So when you do have to have some kind of an intervention or a procedure done, uh, you know who it is. You don't want to start in situations where you've got all kinds of problems and then all of a sudden you've got to deal with a strange person doing a fairly in invasive uh, uh, procedures. What were, let me, uh, what are your reasons for keeping, we've got a small enough group, we can do this. Uh, what reasons did you have for, for visiting the dentist regularly? Just what, what's your gut sense? Why did you go to the dentist regularly? Cleaning. Cleaning? Cleaning. Okay. What, what did the cleaning do? Kept your mouth healthy. Kept your mouth healthy. Good. What do you think? Why did you go really? Regular? Well, cleaning too and then to identify uh, potential or real cavities. Problems? Yeah. Catch them while they're early. Good preventive care. Sorry to... Okay. Wow. It's a very preventive uh, oriented, oriented group. Then let me try on a scale of one to five to find how much you think dental care is tied in with total care. One, they're kind of two separate things. Five, they're all the same thing, and everything in between. Five, five, what do you think? Four, two, three, five, okay, got it. 
Um, it, 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 it's interesting. It goes back to probably at least 100 years. Will Mayo said that having a good dentition adds 10 years to somebody's life. He had no evidence to say that 100 years ago. The evidence is now piling up extensively, but he knew intuitively with the patients he saw that if they had a good, a good set of teeth, that would add time to their life. I said, that's a pretty good reason to commit part of your career, to giving someone health for another 10 years and improve the quality that, that, uh, that they have now. Um, now, also, there are other uh, connections that have been made since. Actually, the, the insurance companies are now having quite a bit to do with uh, getting people to get preventive care. Let me pick the example of diabetes, and we'll come back to this in a minute. They're finding out that if people uh, who are diabetic have regular preventive dental care, then it costs them less for total health care. Okay? And, and they really don't care whether NIH has had a phase three clinical trial, and if you're a statistician, they really don't care that P is less than 0.01. They care it's going to save them money. And so these are people that uh, want people getting preventive services, and they pay for it. So the companies, that, that some insurance companies have it so you have your health and your dental all in one, all in one area. And those are the people that, that they're saying, you will get your dental preventive services, we'll pay it. You don't have no copay, nothing, because it's going to cost us less in the future. Uh, Richard Saunders, who was head of benefits, or a great guy at the university for decades, told me, he said, I want people getting preventive dental services, and we'll do whatever it takes to get people uh, into your dental clinic and other places because they will cost us, they will cost us less money. So let me try this out. Another question, uh, what dental and oral conditions can affect total health? I gave you one. What other kinds of dental and oral conditions can uh, are we finding have an association with your oral health? Yeah. Issues, right. Yeah. yeah. What kind? Yeah. Good. Gingivitis. Okay. Total health. How's any ideas how that happens? Is it something like the bacteria? Like yeah, bacteria. In the yeah, it's an, it's an infection. Uh, dental caries and periodontal disease are infectious disease, just like any other infectious disease. Let me pick the example of diabetes. Uh, back to that again. Um, we have a phenomenal diabetes center here, and uh, we try to work with them on, on making this connection. They know that the connection uh, is there. So what I'm hearing from the diabetes experts, and this is an idea that's been around for a while, but it's really, I think, taking hold, is that not only can diabetes uh, cause damage to tissues and organs, but damage to tissues and organs can exacer exacerbate the diabetes. And it's a two-way street, and, and Dale Abel, who is phenomenal, keeps saying it's a two-way street. So if someone, say, has an infection somewhere, say somebody had an infection on their leg and they were diabetic, you'd want to get that taken care of right away, okay? But we think maybe differently about the business of if they have gum disease, and yet if you could look and how big a sore it can be. If you add up all the raw, um, the raw tissue, the raw gums uh, from having extensive gum disease, you would look at that and you say, oh, we would never tolerate that in any other part of the body. And yet there it is, and it's exacerbating the diabetes. Um, any others that come to mind? I've got a whole list here, but heart problems. We're finding out, you know, people have heart disease. Rheumatic heart fever, heart, excuse me, uh, rheumatic heart disease. Uh, sc yeah, scarlet fever, other, other kinds of fevers when people are young can uh, affect the heart valves and cause, cause a problem there. We also know that having uh, periodontal disease or gum disease, this has been a tougher one and we aren't quite to the point where we can say it with certainty. You know, nothing certain, even the, is the sun going to rise in the east tomorrow. But the evidence are, is piling up that there is a strong connection uh, between heart conditions and, and gum disease. Also, the, the insurance companies, again, if someone has certain types of heart conditions, will pay for their preventive dental services. Uh, another one is kidney, ki even kidney disease. So we're finding out that there are all these connections between oral health, uh, oral health and, and total health. What are some other things about your habits you may have with oral conditions that can affect your total health? Okay, throw another one. Huh? Sugar. There we go. Did you notice the case on the way in? Holy cow! My goodness, they had pop cans and goodies there. 
there's a technical term for this now. It's called it's called um, it's called um, uh, Mountain Dew Mouth is the technical term for it. So you get get some young person and they're driving around delivering pizza or doing whatever it is they're doing, uh, and and you know they've got a can of a can of Mountain Dew, not just one can. They may go through 20 cans of this stuff during the day. I mean that's a lot of sugar, and so we see them tragically in the dental school where they've got just a whole mouthful of tooth decay. Uh, and I'll show you some pictures. I brought, I brought along here the actual uh, device that we use in our clinics to do patient education. It's got 130 videos, and I'll go through some of those. So if you want to see some different procedures, we can, uh, you know, we can show you that. So anyway, the kids wander around. They drink this stuff that's out in the case there. And, and at age 30, these are kids that are losing their teeth. It's just really a tragic thing, tragic thing to see. Um, I'm going to go on to some other things here. How many, how many people take any, you don't have to tell me what they are, taking medications? Anybody take medications? Very many medications? One or two, three, okay. Again, this is a select, this is a select audience already. Uh, but we have uh, our pharmacist, Karen Baker, who's just phenomenal, been teacher of the year several times. And she tells us that if someone's on at least say five medications, five or 10. Some people that we see in our, our geriatrics clinic, maybe on 15 different medications, she says, I don't even need to look at the list of what they are. They have dry mouth. So if people have dry mouth, for sure, they're at much greater risk for having other kinds of, of oral conditions. And in our, in our geriatrics program, I think we have one of the very best in the country, by the way, uh, in, our, in our program here, uh, we see a lot of people that do have dry mouth and we have to deal with them and see them regularly. Sometimes there are different, uh, different things we can give them. I'm not a geriatric dentist, but I do know there are other, other rinses that we can do uh, that will, will somewhat emulate the, the saliva that they're going to have. So that's another one. Just within, the, within your mouth, how about an abscess? So, okay. so if you have any of the conditions I've talked about and you have an abscess, People say, well, it's just a tooth. You know, I don't need to worry about it. But you keep asking the same question. If someone had that abscess somewhere else, uh, would that be something that you would be concerned about? Oh, yeah, you had it on your leg or your arm or someplace else. And, and yet, most people, well, it's just a tooth. You know, so that's another thing. We'll come back to that in, in a little bit. Uh, another thing is the general loss of ability to chew. Uh, humans are just about the only, I think we're the only mammals that can live very long without enamel on your teeth. Any other animal in the wild, once they lose their enamel, they're toast uh, in, in really pretty short order. So, so we want people to keep their teeth, uh, as Will Mayo said, uh, because I think they can, well, we know that they can function uh, quite a bit better. Uh, anybody here, I'm, I'm, I think I know the answer to this question because of the audience here. Anybody here have a lower denture? No. Do you know someone who has a lower denture? You do. Do you have one? No. no. Okay. Do they love it? No. They hate it, right? <laughs> Somewhere between uh, we've reached an equilibrium and I can't stand it. You know, it's, it, it rarely, rarely do people come in with a lower denture. Oh, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. So we want to try to keep people from getting into that, into that situation because there's no way that they're going to be able to eat as well once they have that, as good as we can make these things. And, and we are very good. Uh, we have, an, again, an outstanding department that makes, uh, it's called prosthodontics, that means tooth replacement, that can do all kinds of magical things to, to do that. And I'll show you some pictures of different ways using implants that we can improve the way that people can manage their prostheses, dental prostheses. Okay, we talked about, there's another thing, another piece that comes in if you have too much that's in the sweet, uh, the sweet shop out there is what happens when you eat lots and lots and get lots and lots of calories. Again, that doesn't apply to anybody here. Obesity, yeah, it's a huge issue. So people that eat a lot, it not only is bad for their teeth, uh, it's bad, and, and this is a national epidemic of people that, uh, that have too much to eat, they get obese, all kinds of problems. Uh, I, have, I have a nutritionist here, <laughs> one of only a couple on campus. We have another one. <laughs> anyway, so, um, but that's another thing that, that feeds into the, no pun intended, feeds into the, the oral health of these people. Now, I travel around Iowa uh, quite a bit, and I stop at little uh, coffee shops and so on and meet with people and chat and so on. But if you walk into a little coffee shop somewhere around Iowa around breakfast time, you're going to see a lot of people that are, I would call, pre-diabetic, if I can be generous with that term. 
So it is truly a national epidemic. And again, if we, if we just try to sort out obesity from everything else, that doesn't work. Obesity leads to all kinds of other problems. The oral health is part of it. It feeds into the obesity. Obesity leads to more oral health problems. Uh, the whole thing begins to, you know, begins to fit together. Okay, what, now my next question to the group, you're doing great, you're gonna pass, you need to go to dental school next year, huh? yeah, right? Okay, uh, what habits or conditions can lead to compromised oral health? What kind of habits or conditions can lead to compromised oral health? Smoking. Smoking, very good, yeah, and, and let's come back to that now because uh, one thing we do work on is smoking cessation, the, the most immediate effect uh, for your oral health is it can cause oral cancer. And oral cancer is not, it's not an ordinary kind of cancer. If you get an oral cancer, your chances of five-year survival, it, it's really one of the worst. I mean, pancreatic cancer is, is not that bad, but it really does not have a very bad, very good prognosis. So smoking is something we, we would like to get people to get rid of. Um, we were early, this has been 15 years anyway, to make us a smoke-free campus. And certainly the health center became smoke-free and, and so the whole campus then became, became smoke-free. But oral cancer is something that the surgeons treat like wildfire. When they see it, they become very aggressive uh, to try to get rid of it. Uh, the recurrence is still bad. It can metastasize. And so that's another, that's another one with, with uh, your name with smoking. What are some conditions, yeah? Yeah, good. That's good. Yeah, people that uh, the, the acids that can can can, can cause um, erosion of your teeth. So that's another that's another really good one. What are what are some other ones? Chewing tobacco. Chewing tobacco. Yeah, we got back to the to the um, smoking and chewing tobacco. Uh, the the correlation is a little less strong than smoked tobacco, but still, there's no question there's no question that it's there. How about just plaque? Plaque on your teeth. Uh, plaque's an interesting disease, dental plaque. Uh, it, it's amazing, just like ants, how bacteria can learn, even though they're individual organisms, can learn to function as a team. And they make this very elaborate matrix that's very sticky, and, and it sticks right on your teeth. And it leads to both caries, dental caries, cavities, and periodontal disease, or gum disease. And so that's, a, that's one of the things. And the way you get the plaque off is to brush and floss. And I always tell people, only floss the teeth that you want to keep. So <laughs> the rest of them you don't need to worry about. Um, anyway, another uh, oral habit that we look at that, that even receptionists are in, in pediatric dentistry offices talk about is does your child sleep with the bottle, okay? And does mom have lots of, lots of decay? Uh, because if, if, if you see a child that's sleeping with the bottle, and the parents have a lot of a lot of tooth decay. That kid's at risk because it's an infectious disease. The bacteria of the mother are passed along to the child, believe it or not, and then the child gets this really intense uh, case of dental caries and and even abscessed teeth. So what we try to do is first of all get, manage the mother's decay, get the kid off the bottle right away. But that is something. Uh, if they have no, if the mother is t totally caries free, their risk is much less. But sleeping with the bottle is not a good idea. Uh, breastfeeding, I'm not the expert on this, but uh, I did work for a long time in the National WIC program uh, with, uh, with nutritionists and they kept, there we go again. <laughs> um, and and uh, they got into it and they said, we are the ones, we are the experts, and they did a great job, are doing a great job in trying to get the kids not to get on the bottle too soon and particularly the ones that put uh, sugared, sweetened beverages in it. Just water is fine, milk is not too bad. It's when you put Kool-Aid, pop, like the stuff out in the case in there, and then the kids sleep with the bottle. And, and what's amazing, and I did some research on this a long time ago, is how often the parents know that it's not good for the kid to do that, and yet they did it anyway. And you say, well, can you tell me more about this? And they say, oh, they were just screaming, I've had a long day. Um, you know, and so sure enough, I gave the kid the bottle and it quieted them right down. They went right to sleep and then I went to sleep and everything was fine. So that's another, another thing. Let me, let me talk about some conditions though, oral conditions uh, that fit into to total health. Um, 
Let me throw out one, cleft lip and palate, okay? So we see kids with cleft lip and palate. We have the cleft lip and palate center for the whole state. It's, it's really a national model. Kids come from all over Iowa and they're born with a cleft. Uh, and of course, it's only in one part of their face. But I was on one of the teams when I was in Cleveland uh, that took care of these kids. And that little cleft affects their whole body. It affects their whole family. Uh, everything, everything starts with, with this condition that they have. Because right away they're going to have multiple surgeries. Uh, the speech, you need the speech pathologist, you need the hearing, you know, the audiologist, uh, you need some surgeons, you need orthodontics, uh, pediatric dentistry, a whole team to, uh, you know, to, 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 to take care of these kids. Um, and so that's a condition. It's an oral, strictly an oral condition, but it affects their whole life and the life of people around them. And so we have spent a lot of time not only, not only working uh, to actually repair the problems they have, but dealing with the larger family situation. And one question we try to do better at is with our students, it's actually a nursing question, is what's the patient's capacity to deal with the issues that they have? Because some families have a great family support system, then something like this comes along and, and they manage it. And some families don't. So when students come in, the first thing they want to do, or residents, they want to look at a condition like this, they want to go treat it. They want to go, oh, look at that. Let me fix this. Let me do that. Let me, whoa, 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 back off. Just let's kind of stand back. Watch the family. Watch, what they, watch how they act. Watch how they interact with the, with the child. That'll make all the difference in the world on whether you're going to be effective in doing that. But the point is, we talked today's theme about the connections of oral health and total health, cleft lip and palate, I th I'd say is, is uh, front and center. Let me throw out another one. Uh, kids who are immunocompromised, not to use words, but uh, these are people, for example, uh, children that have had cancer, uh, and now they have to have a bone marrow transplant, and uh, I spent 15 years of my life, uh, I was in charge of a uh, training program in a tertiary care children's hospital. And so we would see these kids in, in the early, this is about 1980, in the early days of bone marrow transplant, uh, they were using these immunosuppressive drugs. These are nasty drugs, okay? They, they suppress your, your bone marrow. You have no defenses. They're in isolation, and the kids are extremely vulnerable to get any kind of infection. And one of the common infections that they used to get, not, not much anymore, is that they would get uh, a candida or a fungal infection. Now, if someone here developed one of those fungal infections, you have a good, I can tell by people in the room, you have a good immune system and you're gonna, your body is gonna deal with it really very quickly. But with these kids, when they're completely immunocompromised, uh, then that condition, it's literally a life-threatening condition. And, and kids in those days would die from this fungal infection. And uh, I had a colleague at Case, we published a, a paper on this, and uh, he did autopsies on these kids. Every single one they lost had this just fulminating oral fungal infection. So we started working on how can we control the infection. And it was just not very nice, the things we did, but it did control the, uh, the infection. And I would go on rounds uh, with these kids and they'd see you and you know, their bleachers are out to here and their hair's all gone. And, and you know, they're, they're, anyway, all the effects of, of having immunosuppression. And they'd see us coming and they'd scream and just go hide under the bed. And then you'd have to go get them and swab their mouth with this stuff, which wasn't very much fun. Their mouth was raw from just having mucositis and so on. And uh, so we, we, but we kept this up. And one day I was having uh, just coffee in the cafeteria in the children's hospital. And I saw the head of hematology oncology and I said, I said, Peter, I can't stand this anymore. You've got to, and, and he looked at me and he says, you're going to keep doing this because we haven't lost a kid in two years. So anyway. So oral infection, oral, oral health affects total health. And so that's, that's our, our continued theme. Let me, I'll just tell you a little bit about myself now that I've rattled on uh, for this long. And uh, uh, I did my dental uh, at Michigan and I practiced for a while. Uh, I was always very interested in pediatric dentistry. I was broke <laughs> and so <laughs> I needed some money to support my habit, <laughs> which is teaching and research and uh, that sort of thing. So, and I've always run, uh, been in charge of clinics until I took this job of really special needs uh, kinds of kids. Um, and then I came to Iowa, did my pediatric dentistry training right here in the, uh, they call it, used to call it hospital school, CDD, Center for Disabilities, whatever it is now. 
so which where we still have uh, still have a clinic. So I've worked with uh, with people, kids that have had lots of compromising uh, conditions, uh, and I can tell you that every one of those, you have a, a courageous family that's involved trying to keep these kids healthy. And so I, I'm always my hat is always off uh, if, if someone has a child that has special needs, uh, how how important that that will be. Um, also, as I say, ran a program with the Tertiary Care Children's Hospital and worked uh, on a public health, I'm going to come back to the public health piece in a, in a couple minutes here, uh, looking at the larger picture. Because when we started today, everyone held up their hand, I go to the dentist all the time. So what do we do about the people right now, and really the crisis, crisis is the word in healthcare right now for getting access to people with special needs. Um, I was in Washington uh, a couple weeks ago, and just to be bipartisan, so I asked people who are both <laughs> Republicans and Democrats, and including one of our one of our U.S. senators, and I, I said, okay, can you help me with uh, how we're going to take care of special needs people? The political term is people with pre-existing conditions, and I said, okay, because um, we everyone agrees, Republicans and Democrats, we've got to take care of people with with uh, pre-existing conditions. They should not be left out. Uh, but I said the the issue, the choices we seem to have that have been tried. Number one, the healthy people pay. That was the mandate. Nobody liked that, right? Everyone, we're now going through a flap. Nobody liked that. And I said, number two is the government pays. And I haven't heard any other option. And yet everyone's saying we're going to take care of people with pre-existing conditions. Uh, can you help us with this? And, and I got no, no response. So I'm, I'm just not that optimistic that right now, given the, the climate, and, and I think I can be bipartisan, nonpartisan in this, uh, that that's that probably that's going to get fixed anytime you know anytime right away. So we will continue to see these kids. Uh, we see a lot of them in the hospital or adults. Um, so anyway, that's a little bit about my my background. So we kind of touched on this uh, before, but let me let me try this. What are some reasons that you have for wanting to keep good oral health after you've listened to me talk on about this? What are some reasons other than my teeth are clean, they feel good. What are, what are some reasons you want to keep your good oral health? Have a nice smile. You have a nice smile. Okay, let's, that's, that's a great answer. Um, Forty years ago, 50 years ago, you know, I, I said I practiced a little while, and I knew I wanted to go into pediatric dentistry, but I picked the town, I grew up in Michigan, I picked the town of Flint, Michigan. This is before they had water problems and when General Motors was still chugging along and all that, uh, because they had a Mott Children's Health Center there and they gave out stipends and I would go down there and talk to them. So I practiced, and then I so I got one of these nice fellowships, uh, um, and and so on. Um, but um, but it, the, the, I, where I was working, where I associated, and I was very upfront with the fellow I associated with. I said I am going to try to get into a really good pediatric dentistry program, and I'll stay here as long as I you know. And so I worked really hard, and we had a, a good relationship. But it, it was it was a very manufactured, it was a very blue collar group I had. Loved it. I mean, these people showed up on time, cash on the barrel head. Tell me what you know. Tell me it was just boom, 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 uh, everything. But the big thing was appearance was less of an issue. They wanted good health, but the notion that you know, in the last 40, 50 years, we've shifted from a manufacturing society to a service society. I think most people in here are service. I, would, I don't know where university professors fall in all this, but <laughs> more on the service side. And, and you, you really can't go for an interview with bad teeth. You know, there are all kinds of jokes uh, about bad teeth, but uh, you really can't do that. I think that's had a huge impact on, on people uh, seeking oral health. Is they not only, it's not only part of their total health, but they have to do this if they want to get a really good job. You have to have, to have good health uh, for, for a good teeth. Um, Let's see. Well, I'm going to come to some stuff here on procedures here in a couple minutes on, on dental, dental implants. So we've kind of talked about the individual to this point, oral health as part of total health, uh, con continuous with total health. But let me talk about some public health initiatives on this. So we want to not only for the, the, in, the individual person to have really good uh, oral health, but we want the public. We want to reach out to the public. And as a profession, 
um, one of the things we talk about with our students is the responsibility, the social responsibility to try to reach out to everybody. What are some things that we can do, have done or can do uh, that have been successful or we could do even better to try to reach out to the public for better uh, oral health? Yeah? Um, embed either educational programs or professionals okay. in elementary or primary yep. schools for okay. early intervention. Yep. Health education. That's right. That's a really good one. What are some others? Free dental clinics. Free dental clinics. Okay. This country, uh, only about 5 or 7 percent of the dental care provided in this country is paid for by the government. That's dramatically different from almost every other industrialized nation. Now, I'm not going to get into whether you should do it, don't need to do it, uh, whatever, whatever it is, but, uh, but dental clinic, free dental clinics do make a difference. I have colleagues from Brazil, and this is not, part, I mean, part, people, some people in Brazil are, are tremendously wealthy, but there are some pockets of hugely poor people, and they keep telling me, oh, yeah, the Brazilian health system has a dentist in the schools, in the schools. We, we do not. So we've got a big gap in this country about uh, people that have uh, access to dental care and those that do not have access to dental care. So I think public health programs, that's on my list, and that's a really good one. What are some other things? Talked about smoking cessation programs. That was one. What else? Soda taxes. So do taxes, I love it. I lived in West Virginia, and they put a one cent, one cent tax on the sodas. It actually went to the university. I said, I like that idea, we should, <laughs> we should do that. But I think make, making people aware, just like smoking, that if you're drinking that stuff out in that case, uh, I mean, that's a, <laughs> that's a time bomb waiting to go off if you keep doing it. A great idea, I love it. I did not have it on my list, but. That's a, that's a good idea. But they did try it, and it made a lot of money, and it did make people think twice uh, you know, before they'd have, they'd have the soda. And they only put it on the sweetened soda. So if you drink diet, it, it, you don't get taxed. So I thought that was a, that was a cool idea, too. Yeah. Huh. Um, I'm going to throw out another one, fluoridation. OK. Um, Iowa, let's see. Iowa City was fluoridated in the, I'm going to say, early 50s somewhere a long time ago. The first water fluoride was in Grand Rapids, Michigan in 1946 or 7. Uh, and then it took off. Everything went fine. There were no anti-fluoridationists. Um, then soon there was a group, the anti-fluoridationists. Uh, the only thing I'd, I'd ask, if, if it ever is on uh, a city anything, please go, go speak up for it. Uh, it's one of the, the um, Centers for Disease Control called it one of the ten top ten public health success stories in the 20th century. So in Des Moines, I was in Des Moines, gave this talk uh, earlier, and they were threatened with losing their water fluoridation. Uh, it reduces, if, if you have never had it before and there isn't fluoride in other things, it can, it can reduce decay hugely, you know, in the multiple teen, tens of percentage points. There, you can, argue how much. Now fluoride is in all kinds of things, and we've actually found out we can cut back a little bit because it's in the water, it's in processed foods, uh, it's in all kinds of stuff that you, that you eat and drink. So we're finding out we can back off a little bit, but if we eliminate it, uh, the, there are enough studies to show that the decay within a very few years starts going back and children are, are, are forced to uh, have their teeth fixed uh, more often. So fluoridation is another one. Another one is dental sealants. We have public programs for dental. Does anyone know what dental? Okay, you know you have little grooves and fissures in your teeth. I'll show you pictures in a minute. Uh, and we found out that you can, uh, this goes back again 30, 40 years, that you can actually uh, seal those grooves off and it will completely prevent the decay in the grooves and fissures of the teeth. So th these are all public health problems, uh, public health issues that are, that are, that are going on. So. Um, let me talk a little bit about the sort of the politics of this. I think everybody here has uh, what we would call dental insurance, right? Dental insurance. If you're a student, you get dental insurance, right? Or you have it from home, whatever. Okay, so I, I would describe it as a uh, really an employee benefit because uh, insurance, and, and it started in World War II, where employers wanted good employees. And one of the things to attract them was to get to give them a benefit that they didn't have to pay tax on. 
So if they could give them the insurance directly, then they didn't have to pay tax on it. Uh, so, but the, it's really not insurance, it's an employee benefit because insurance is, is usually for things that are catastrophic and unpredictable, okay? And, and dental is rarely catastrophic and on any kind, even, even in a group of 100 people, it, be, it starts to become very predictable. But it is something, I think it's great, and I think people are getting more and more, employers are getting more and more in tune with trying to make the preventive services with no copay, you know. So if you want, if you want to have different kinds of aesthetic things done, you got to pay more for those. But the basic preventive services, I think, all of the insurers are, and the companies are wanting this, so they get they get good uh, good uh, insurance. Um, one one issue uh, to talk about also uh, is the issue of Medicare. I'm getting I'm there. <laughs> anyway, uh, dentistry is not in Medicare. Okay, and in 1965, there's a famous picture of Lyndon Johnson um, standing when he signed the Medicare Medicaid bill, and the A the AMA fought it tooth and nail. Um, are you getting up? No. Okay. She's going to give me the hook when her time is. Done. <laughs> so when I stand up, we're talking. Okay. Uh, there's a famous picture, and conspicuously absent from this picture uh, is the American Medical Association because they fought it. Conspicuously present is the president of the National Dental Association. That's the Association for African American <laughs> Dentists because they were supportive of it. Anyway, there was a huge fight, and so the story goes that by the time this fight was over, people were exhausted. And, and rather than take on the American Dental Association, which also did not want to get in Medicare, uh, they didn't take on that fight. And so dentistry was left out, one of the great what ifs. But the problem it creates, especially in a place like Iowa, is we don't have that benefit that has, has dental services. So we have something like 400 uh, nursing homes in Iowa. We go to about 10, and I think we have one of the best programs in the country. But I can tell you that people in those homes, half of them and more, need dental care. And, and all of them are struggling on how do we finance this, how do we take care of it, uh, and so on. We do have Medicaid, and that was started again back in, uh, in the 19, 1960s. And then that was insured, that was assured that you had to provide dental services in the Medicaid program. It was called uh, the EPSDT program, and if you can't remember what, the, what that stands for, um, and it'll capture the era, it, it means every president should destroy tapes, okay? So can you guess which president I'm talking about? Okay, so that was when it happened the first time. Then there was the, later on they called it the S-CHIP program, the Children's Health Initiative program. That was, that was financed to, to go from 100% of poverty to up you know, 200%, maybe a little more, and that happened in 1997. So the children are really better protected, and that program has a lot better participation from the dentist than the larger Medicaid program. We just went through the Medicaid expansion for adults. My view on this is, and we got real involved in this, is this is the largest uh, social program since Medicare and Medicaid. So when it was going through for all the political baggage and all the talk, it's gonna be, we said, no, no, we've got to get involved. So even though the, the, um, the website didn't work in the original rollout of, Medicaid, of, the, of the Affordable Care Act, that was a separate issue, and uh, even though, can I keep my plan, even if it's a crummy plan, that was separate. But we saw from day one, even before it was passed, that the elephant in the room was going to be Medicaid expansion. That has meant um, over 100, I think it's 130,000 people are now eligible. And we are seeing a lot in the dental school. We have a large uh, public clinic um, effort. You mentioned public clinics a while ago. Iowa, I think, took a big assist. Uh, about 25 years ago, we had three dentists working in public clinics in the whole state, okay? And what we found out was that that's based on becoming a, being designated a dental health profession shortage area. And the two things you have to do to get that designation is you have to have a certain dentist to population ratio and you have to fill out the application form. And Iowa had not filled out the application forms. So Pete Damiano, uh, head of our public policy center, uh, contacted some people in Des Moines. We suddenly went to over, I think it's 18 uh, clinics and now 45 people working. So we have a lot more people in Iowa now than we did 25 years ago. 
Um, about uh, about 40% of dental care though is paid for out of pocket. So about 40, 45% um, and the rest by the government, which is less than 10%. So that's it. I'm going to, if I can get this gadget to work, and if I can't, I've got an expert right here. I'm going to show you guys some things here. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. Let's see. Oh, wrong way. Here we go. So I'm going to show you a couple things here. This is what we use in the um, in our in our clinics. So let me show you just a couple things here. Start with something everybody knows about, and I know you came to see this. Okay, here is a root canal about to happen here. Can you see that now? Oh, straighter. Is that better? Okay, there's your tooth. Hang on, hang on. These are, this is, this is the bone around it. These are your gums. This is the nerve of the tooth with all the blood vessels and so on. Okay, watch out. Here it comes. This is tooth decay. Now, this could be prevented by a sealant. What's about to happen here? Should we start moving in a second? I hope it's not stuck. Okay, it's stuck right now. It worked before. There it goes. Okay, now, now you can see the tooth. Here it comes, look out. Here comes the tooth decay, getting, ouch! <laughs> right into the nerve of the tooth, right? You see this? Okay. Here it goes, and then it causes an abscess down here. So what the dentist then does, when the person comes in, okay, and uh, takes all the, the nerve out, goes down, takes it out, And then the abscess clears for a while, but you don't want to leave it that way, so now you got to do something. So now you put the root canal back in. And you're numb. We do use anesthesia here. Okay? All the jokes about root canals. Anyway, here it goes. So, then you put a filling in, and we're done. Okay, that's one. Let's see now. Then we do, we do, we've got a phenomenal orthodontics department here. Um, let me just run through a couple of these and I'll wind things up. Um, this shows when you have crooked teeth. You see that? And um, they had a case uh, competition. 60 schools around the country competed. And then the last four years, Iowa finished second, first, first, and first. So if you need your teeth straightened, this is a pretty good place to go. It would be like winning the World Series. So your teeth are crooked, and then they put braces on the teeth. You've probably all seen this. And then they put a different wire, change the wire several times. And as I say, all the kids with cleft lip and palate need their braces, all of them. It's 100%. So we've got a great place for that to happen. And then slowly the teeth get straightened, and then you put on a retainer. And you've got nice straight teeth again. That's a simple one. Let's see. We've got 130 of these here. This is a great little gadget here for giving um, educa uh, education here.
Here's one where sometimes you've lost a tooth, and um, I can show you. And you, you, everybody here has a sinus uh, up above your teeth on the upper upper jaw. And um, let's see if it's stuck. There it goes. So uh, anyway, so the sinus can, if you lose a tooth, can expand. And we want to put an implant in there, and we can't do that. And so what you have to do is you have to lift the sinus up so you can then put an implant in. This gets kind of interesting. See the gently push up the, 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 sinus, the sinus lining. Push it up. It's a tedious process. Can we do this while it's all numb? Here we go. There, there are multiple, there's more. Well, the, the actual, this one procedure can be done in one visit. You know, in, in just a second, you'll see, then they're going to fill it up in a minute. Like, once it's numb, you want to do as much as you can. Yeah. So you don't have to do that all the time. Then we're filling it in with um, uh, material that allows the bone to grow into it. It it's, makes kind of a scaffold. The bone then grows into it. Okay, whoops, and then you... Thought I had anyway. So then you put an implant in. I got the wrong one, but there's one where it also shows an implant. I'll show an implant here in just a minute. No, we'll skip that one. Let's see. Okay, here's one where, oops, there we go. Where someone has lost all their lower teeth, unfortunately, that's what the implant looks like. So what we want to do is put four implants in either two or four, or some number of implants. That's to give stability, because the lower denture will just float around. And then they make an imprint with all four implants. And then they make their teeth, and then they kind of click in. And I love it when the students, I, can, I have lunch with the students often, and I can tell if they've had one of, the, one of these patients, because the same day they walk out and they say, my life has changed. You know, I, it, it's a completely different experience. I can chew again. You know, it'll never be as good as the real thing, but, but you can. Um, you, you can uh, quickly do that. A couple more here and then we'll wrap it up. So sometimes you fall down, fall go boom, right? Okay, and you chip your tooth. So you can make it anything you want here. So the materials now are such, we, we've got people that lecture all over the country and all over the world on, on appearance or aesthetic dentistry, uh, and they can take people that really have raunchy looking teeth and make them look beautiful. I think I, it's been long enough. Hayden Fry, when he came here, for example, would not smile, okay? And he came over to the dental school. So anyway, they can make your tooth look real. Hayden Fry had, had really an awful smile. Uh, and they straightened his teeth and did aesthetic work and so on. And then the pictures he took later on, he, he smiled uh, all the time. Okay, let's see if I got one more here. That's the idea. Anyway. One more. I'm not going to show gum surgery here, but we could do that too. Anyway, let's see if we have So if somebody has, lo again, lost some teeth, it's amazing what you could do with dental implants. So you make a, a hole in the bone, enough so that uh, it doesn't touch the nerve of the teeth. It's a very delicate procedure. You really want your surgeon to know what they're doing when they do one of these, because if they're a little bit off, it, it causes all kinds of problems. And here comes the implant. There's one implant. Bingo.
Do these things talk? They don't, do they? The students were talking Yeah, right, okay. So anyway, then you put the other implant in, and then you can put a bridge on top of it, and there you go. So anyway, I think we'll kind of wrap this up now and see if we have any questions. I told my time off. You might want to just clarify that those are used by our students, students in yeah. clinics. Yeah. So if a patient has a question as far as the procedure that they're having, the student can actually go get the iPad and show right. them. Yeah, these are really handy. Uh, for, they're very visual. Trying to explain this stuff is sometimes like trying to explain a ballet on a, on a blank stage. You know, it, it's nice to have the real, the real people there. So anyway, um, I did bring along some handouts. Did you know, whoops, uh, this tells about our dental school. 80% uh, of the dentists in Iowa are our alums. 99% of the people in Iowa are within a 30-minute drive of a practicing alum. It shows where they are. Uh, we've got... Um, Iowa, as far as our students go, we're always among the very top. Uh, we're, as far as our national board scores, we're one or two standard deviations above the, uh, above the average. Uh, I think we've got a phenomenal uh, faculty here. Leadership is something every, we have all the, we're one of only two dental schools that have all the advanced programs and every single one of those has national leaders uh, that are in the councils where policy and standards are being set. Um, and so we think that's good to have that level of quality, they all teach. We want them back bringing that level of quality to our, to our students. Uh, research is something we've been very big on. Research sometimes takes a couple decades. Uh, I'm gonna give a couple of quick examples. How many people have been to the dentist and they took an x-ray and you say, they see this spot on your tooth? Mm -hmm. You have that? Okay. So it used to be, 40 years ago, you'd see that spot on your tooth and you go zip right into the tooth. You drill into the tooth. Not anymore. Well, sometimes, but oftentimes we found out that up to a, a point beyond what we used to think was possible, the tooth can remineralize. The mineral can go back into the tooth. So we had uh, research supported by the National Institutes of Health to show the theory of this, that remineralization could happen and how far you could go along before you had to actually intervene in the tooth. And then we got quite a bit of money from corporate, Procter & Gamble and so on, uh, to, to find out uh, how often you have to use different cocktails, many of them using fluoride and so on, uh, how much, what concentrations, and so on. But I, what I can tell you is because research done at the University of Iowa, tens of millions of teeth were not drilled into. That may not sound like much, but most people think that's pretty cool and that's a good way to spend your money. Uh, implants is another one where we got NIH funding on the theory of how implants interact with the body uh, and got some of that resolved. And then we had um, Clark Stanford, who was here, did a lot of work on that. On, on, for example, you saw the one where you're missing implants in the front. So should you have a longer one, shorter one, bigger one? So which mousetrap works the best? So what I can also tell you is because of research done here, the chances are much better that your implant will work. By the way, uh, we have now four of the Big Ten dental schools now have Iowa deans. So <laughs> I'm we're getting tired of this. <laughs> you get your good people and they leave. We now have some very exciting research going on. We just got a huge NIH grant with six institutions around the country on better identifying high risk uh, people for dental caries in medical communities. And another thing for children that are at high risk or have early decay of using different, uh, different things. Right now we're using silver diamine fluoride uh, to paint on the teeth that slows down the decay. These are for people, they, they may be in Head Start programs, you don't know if they're coming back. We use it for Native Americans, sometimes in nursing homes where you aren't sure you're gonna have continuous care. So anyway, a lot of research going on. Growing bone is a big deal now. People that have had cleft lip or palate, people that have cancer surgery, people that have severe, severe gum disease, uh, and so on. And we're finding ways you can actually grow bone so it can come back and then you can have a much more normal dentition. I'm supposed to stop. Oh. Questions? Comments? Okay. Well, thank you for coming. Anyway, that's it. Good. Thank you so much, Dr. Johnson. And um, please do visit our website to find out what uh, the next lecture will be. Thank you all.